Okay, so yeah, good morning everyone and a very warm welcome to our SCAD and wellbeing event. Um, so the psychological impact of SCAD ha has long been recognised by the SCAD community. Um, for, and for many, probably even most of us, the, uh, the, the mental well-being after SCAD um, is as important really as the, the physical healing from a SCAD. Um, so in today's session, we're going to be looking at some research that has been carried out um, into SCAD and well-being. So we're going to um, be joined by Dr. Colette Sohn. And she kindly offered to lead the first part of um, today's program and she's going to be joined by her colleague uh, Sue Morris. So we're also going to look at the impact of the current pandemic on our mental health. So we're going to be covering uh, post-traumatic stress and post-traumatic growth. So they're probably terms that you've, you've, used, you've heard. Um, so we're going to look at what they mean to us um, as individuals and also as a group. Um, and then we're also going to take a look at the Beat SCAD Cardiac Rehabilitation Survey and what that tells us about the need for psychological support after SCAD. Um, and then we're also going to touch on the resources that Beat SCAD have available, so on our website and also in terms of the, the buddy service that we now offer. Um, so Colette, if you'd like to start sharing your screen, um, and for those of you who don't know Colette, um, she works as an educational psychologist in a local authority um, and also as a lecturer. Well, I've lost my, lost my notes. <laughs> Stuck over. <laughs> a lecturer <laughs> at the University of Birmingham. Um, Colette's had two SCADs and also has an FMD diagnosis. Um, and Sue Morris is, um, as I say, a colleague. She's an honorary senior lecturer in applied educational and child psychology at the University of, of Birmingham. So I will hand over to Colette. Um, good morning, everybody. I was slightly concerned there that my PowerPoint started to work on its own. I hope it's not on automatic pilot. Um, Thanks ever so much for coming today. I feel slightly overwhelmed and I can actually feel my heart right now. So I'm going to just keep an eye on it and make sure I keep nice and calm as I go through um, because it's uh, it's just so great to see so many, so many people. And um, uh, Sue and I hope that, um, you know, what, what I present and, and the conversations that we have um, may help in, in some way. Um, and, but just the very fact that we've connected is, is, is super. So, um, as Beck says, um, sadly or, or otherwise, um, I've had two SCADs and, um, and then more recently um, a diagnosis of fibromuscular dysplasia. Um, and I suppose what's going to happen this morning is I'm going to share with you uh, the research um, but also relate it to my experiences, but just to remind everybody that they're just my experiences, really, um, and everybody's got their own, um, and that's all okay. So um, I've got a fantastic uh, combination of jobs. Um, I work in a local authority, um, a very deprived local authority, as an educational psychologist, or oh, it is, and, um, uh, and also I link up with the University of Birmingham. And uh, this review that, um, and this presentation, I've been helped with some colleagues from my local authority, uh, Zoe, Lydia and Beth, and I'm absolutely thrilled that Sue's here um, with me today, um, both as a, as a colleague at the University of Birmingham, but also a, a real supporter of SCAD, Beat SCAD. So what I want us to do first, before we get into the content proper, is I want us just to pause and reflect on our well-being. And um, it's really important that we think about how we're feeling and what we're doing to look after ourselves, um, particularly in these times where our connections have been, you know, taken away from us. We're, we're isolated even more. And so this, this kind of activity is just to remember the little things that we are doing for ourselves. Um, and so um, what I'd like you to do is just think of those things. And, and if you can, um, write them into the chat box. I can't see it at the moment, um, but others can, and they're gonna help me now 
uh, with that. So these are the little things that you're doing to just just for yourselves because times are busy, times are crazy, um, and it's really important that we can just make ourselves think about those little things um, that we do. Anything coming up? What are they? There are things to do with, um, I, I guess, there's a, a lot of exercise, walking particularly, um, which of course I guess is communing with um, nature as well as exercise, um, things like um, sewing, reading, sort of um, oh, constructive um, and creative activities within the home. Mm -hmm. Um, the sort of looking after and sharing the enjoyment of um, family pets. It's hard to keep up actually with the pace <laughs> of um, Brilliant. very creative people, Pilates, cycling, um, patchwork, knitting, praying. I think that's interesting, isn't it? Is the, the spiritual um, connections standing barefoot in the snow nicola um <laughs> wow um, being grateful that's a fantastic thing isn't it just trying to maintain an appreciative mindset which runs so counter to the dominant um culture where we the, the media tend to be saturated with um the, the tough times and the impact the, the stable evening bath and calm music i have the whole sense of um candles and zen there mm, fantastic and connection with friends through phone um zoom um allison person after my own heart baking cakes and eating them <laughs> <laughs> weekly croissants yeah. the time with the family um, and time to talk to your children about what's going on in their lives fantastic. fantastic so the, what's really great i mean it's great that we're doing these little things um to look after ourselves if you if you're not then just remind yourself that you need to because it's just it's a tiny little thing will make a very large difference to how we're feeling just now um and um yeah great thanks for the thanks for sharing those um, I'll move on now if that's okay. So uh, with the stuff that we're going to share, I think it's really important that we just remember uh, that feeling distress um, is a, uh, or feeling emotions per se, is a, is a human thing. It's normal for us to feel um, emotions it's normal for us to feel distress and so it's it's okay um, for us to feel psychological distress following such a traumatic event like a SCAD and we're all individuals and we all will cope with our SCAD in our own way um, and that's okay we don't have to fit a box we don't because we're so special in that sense um, um, and there's no right way or wrong way of um, recovering from a SCAD or moving on with our lives. We're all different in the way that we do it. Um, and there are many, many ways that we can actually help ourselves. And hopefully today uh, we'll, we'll share a few and then in, enable people to reflect. Um, and what's really important is that we, we won't all require psychological therapies or medication to help us with our mental health as we recover um, from our SCADs some of us will and that's okay you know it's okay to accept that um we, you know we might need some some help i need help with my slides and um, then behaving in their own way so first up then what do we actually mean by psychological impact well we mean uh feelings um feelings of of, of anxiety um, anxiety where we're worried about things, we're a bit um, apprehensive about things, we're a little bit more fearful 
about things when we're anxious um you know we're just a bit a bit nervous so before i started speaking this morning i can categorically say i was experiencing a level of anxiety um and it's moving on now um, because i feel a bit a bit better uh, about what's going on depression is more about uh, low mo low mood feelings of sadness um feeling a bit helpless and and like uh, tearful about things and and kind of like um kind of not 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 feeling motivated to, to to do things um so there's a there's a subtle difference between anxiety and, and depression in that sense and experiencing post-traumatic stress um, and this is something that we're finding and i'll come to a bit later in terms of our children and families and school staff around uh, responding to covid but certainly in terms of our population uh, we we can experience post-traumatic stress and that might be things like having nightmares uh, flashbacks where we kind of play a video uh, in our minds um, around an event or um, what's gone on so maybe thinking about um, you know the whole event around the scad happening and then into hospital and all of the detail um, around that um, and then beginning to feel kind of guilty about having those feel feelings um, and also kind of um, not being able to sleep but i'll come back to post-traumatic stress a bit later but you can see there you know that, that there are different definitions um, that we're going to think about today so zoe uh, did a very um quick but effective uh, snapshot into the research that's been done over the years and this is really interesting because I had my SCAD in 2014 where you can see that my first SCAD sorry in 2014 where uh, you can see that 105 published papers were out around research into SCAD and then if you go to my second time which was 2016 that's that year there was 130 released and then this year at last year sorry there were 180 so this is really interesting in terms of the intelligence of the medical community around what to do so i remember that my cardiologists were googling you know how long to keep me in in hospital um, whereas um, the second scad they knew what scad was and they also knew what they needed to do to help me so this i think is it is influencing influencing that so what we did was we um and that's the royal we because it was zoe and lydia and beth what they did was they looked at they did a search of the literature um i'd already done it once in 2016 but they did an update search of the literature um, they focused in on SCAD and mental health and then they focused in on SCAD and psychological rehab. Now, we know that um, in a minute uh, Karen's going to share the results of Beat SCAD survey, but this just gives us an intro, intro into, into that. So we were interested in levels of anxiety and depression and post-traumatic stress. We were also interested in whether survivors had a history of anxiety of depression before um, their SCAD and also how psychological rehab might help survivors, might help us. So the first, this first slide kind of gives us some information about levels of anxiety, depression and post-traumatic stress and you can see how it varies over the years and so that we, they found four papers where the, uh, there was some information in, in relation to this and um, uh, in 2014 you can see that that's uh, not that high but then suddenly in 2019 we've got some very high levels of, um, of depression and what's interesting in terms of this is is kind of like how was the information collected so this is about how the research was done um, so, for example, um, in 2019, which is that very high one, there were only 14 um, participants in that. So 71% of 14. So that's interesting in itself. Whereas, uh, for example, the 2021, there were 512 involved in that. And they 
Um, that was a survey. So how they collected the information is important. Um, and also, I mean, really in interestingly, in the 2014 study, it was 44 months, the average time between SCAD and asking them about their anxiety and depression was 44 months. Um, and I think that's really interesting because, um, you know, as we, as we move on or, or try to move on with our lives, um, for the majority of us, we will begin to um, have a new way of living and our anxiety should come down. So that's interesting how, how far away that was from the point. Now, interestingly, um, in the 2019 um, study, sorry, in the 2019 study, post-traumatic stress was kind of like highlighted there. Um, and what was really interesting is that those people uh, in relation to post-traumatic stress were saying that they, they had similar feelings of control to cancer patients, i.e. they didn't have much control over what was going on for them. So that was part of the thing that was causing the trauma, um, as opposed to maybe a, a traditional heart attack where people might be encouraged to think about the, the lifestyle issues around uh, heart health. Um, SCAD survivors were saying, actually, this is about chance, um, so I don't feel much control. So that's really interesting. But overall, fundamentally, we, we do experience um, anxiety, depression and post-traumatic stress following our SCADs um, and uh, one of the questions that's come in is how does that relate to the general population and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that um, a bit later on um, and in a way it's kind of normal and okay to feel these things um, because it's a traumatic event um, you know if we didn't feel it um, that might be a bit of a worry so if we break that down a little bit more, um, we can see here Liang and, and colleagues found that um, there were higher scores. So here we are closer to the point of SCAD. Um, so if you know, I don't know about people uh, on the call, but I completed um, a general anxiety and depression uh, questionnaire both times when I was in hospital. Um, and so the closer it would be, then the higher my levels of anxiety would be, this would suggest. Um, this uh, research suggested that uh, there's a higher level of anxiety and depression when the survivors are younger. Um, perhaps because the, the shock of, of having something at all wrong with you, when you're actually living a perfectly active and healthy life, and then this comes across you um, and, and literally takes you out uh, for a while is, is more shocking um, and also that the around um, around giving birth although interestingly more recently Dr Adlam found that there was no more uh, difference between um, PSCADS patients um, and other SCADS patients so there's a kind of like a question around that and then more recently Dr Adlam and colleagues found that uh, there were higher levels of anxiety and depression and this again is a, is a no-brainer really around those of us that have been re-hospitalized um, or had recurrent SCADs. Interestingly though my own experience was that SCAD1 I experienced, I didn't know at the time because I'm only a psychologist at the end of the day, but uh, post-traumatic stress um, and I was really quite psychologically um, depleted um, for seven months. I couldn't return to work for seven months after SCAD 1, but it was almost like SCAD 2. I was ready um, with the strategies that I was going to use um, and with the help of colleagues um, and friends and family, I was up and running after seven weeks. So it, it is interesting that um, for me, I kind of booked that trend. I was, um, I was in a different place, but Dr. Adlam's research uh, indicates that. Okay. So, in terms of psychological well being, um, some of us, um, some SCAD survivors, did require and, and do require to have um, ongoing psychological support. And that might be um, medical in terms of pharmaceutical 
or it could be psychological intervention. And so you can see Liang here found that um, of, her, of their cohort, um, 30, a third, about a third for depression and about a third for anxiety needed further support. Um, and what's really interesting here, I think, about this second point is actually, um, I'm not even going to attempt to um, pronounce that name, um, uh, they found in 2020 that really after about three years, we were no worse off uh, than somebody who'd had acute coronary syndrome. So um, although we might have been to start off with, uh, we, we aren't. Um, uh, as time goes on. So that I, I kind of think indicates something about how we, how we recover. Zoe helped me with the slides and so this is one of her brilliant slides. So somebody um, asked a question about what happens before SCAD in terms of our well-being, um, I think, but we'll come to that um, when Karen does questions, but this is this slide is quite interesting. So before SCAD, um, Liang and, and colleagues found actually that about again about just over a third of us had a history of depression and anxiety, um, and quite a lot of us actually um, around half would say that we ha had experienced an intense emotional. Uh, experience of stress before our SCAD event and certainly for me that that rings true every time for both of them and these kinds of things might be related to work um, it might be the death of a loved one um, which it was in my case um, it could be around moving house um, it could be around thinking about relationships and relationship breakdowns so um, research has found that the, the normal kind of um, experiences that we would say are very stressful in life for everybody, actually for us, we as survivors are attributing some of those events to our SCAD. Now, everybody who loses a loved one has job related stress, moves house, etc., doesn't go on to have a SCAD. So there's something about us in terms of how we respond to emotional um, experiences. Okay. So the next slide um, is about cardiac and psychological rehab. And this is from our literature, uh, our literature review. And it's interesting that, that research, and of course this will complement what Karen talks about in a minute. So it's interesting to know that um, people who actually do go are identifying higher levels of anxiety. So they're kind of thinking that they need some rehabilitation because of the levels of stress and anxiety that, that they're, fearing, they're experiencing. And the other thing is, is that they, um, they're experiencing higher scores um, of depression and anxiety than those attending who don't have a SCAD. So again, here we are, we're just a little bit more anxious and depressed than say somebody who's had um, whatever a typical heart attack is. Um, so that, that's interesting. So in terms of self-selection, we'll go if we feel more anxiety. And certainly again with me, I mean, I was offered it um, and I, I wasn't sure whether I wanted to go or not, but because of my levels of what I now re think about as post-traumatic stress, I went and it helped. Um, but I might not have necessarily gone if not. And in terms of the benefits, um, what people have said in relation to the research about the benefits is that um, seven, about 75% of people um, have indicated that they've they experienced an emotional benefit following cardiac rehab. And people also found great improvements in terms of scores for depression. And so people were talking about both physical and mental benefits of of cardiac rehab. 
And what the research tells us in terms of what would be helpful to help us engage in cardiac rehab as SCAD survivors is that we get that little nudge, that push from, from our cardiologist, you know, or um, from our primary care providers that we need to do it. And that pathway, because we know that that's not always the case. Um, and sometimes we have to search these things out because we're a bit different from, from others. Um, but actually people say if, if they were kind of like recommended it, they, they'd go for it. Others talked about SCAD specific programs because we, we do kind of seem a bit on a bit different maybe from other people who go. And so that connectivity with um, rehab um, participants is, is kind of takes a bit of time to get, get into. Um, and so people talked about having SCAD specific programs. And then the other thing that's, that, that SCAD survivors talked about was having kind of online patient education and support groups, which of course Beat SCAD is a, a, an amazing ex example of. Um, and this will all run into um, Karen's presentation in a bit. Okay, so what does all that actually mean then in the, at the end of the day? Well, what it means is that some of us, um, quite a few of us really, may experience uh, may have experienced um, at least moderate anxiety or depression in our lives before our SCAD. Uh, others of us may not have done. Um, uh, some of us may have experienced um, intense emotional distress. Some of us may not have done. Um, and some I think Colette's frozen. Just while she's um, thawing, there are some interesting <laughs> comments in the chat, aren't there? I mean, just while Colette's early slides highlight the growth of research-informed intervention, we have Anne, uh, Anne, I don't know the date of your SCAD, but telling us that you've never spoken to a medical practitioner who knew anything about SCAD, February 2021. So I think all the points Colette's made about the, the variants are significant. Um, there's quite a few comments echoing the point of uh, highly stressful life events immediately preceding the SCAD and somebody actually highlighting that intense sporting activity appeared to have been um, the, the kind of, if you like, biological, physiological stressor. And I guess that connects to some questions earlier about when we were talking about coping, what kind of physical exercise and um, sport are, um, I guess, kind of healthy and safe for people who've experienced SCADs. And, and there's also an interesting echoing of um, from people who've responded the differential recovery time from the first and second SCADs with it looks as if people um, are learning from their response to the first in, in order to um, recover, um, well, recover sufficiently to resume normal life. So, yeah, the chat, I think, is offering some really fascinating commentary, um, positioning these general trends alongside people's lived experiences. Sorry, I'm probably more struck by them as a relative outsider, just thinking, oh, wow. Is Colette back? She's just coming, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think your input's very valuable, though, Sue, you know, because for us as, as the patients, as the survivors, it can be hard for us to understand the impact on, on family members and friends. So, so to hear it, I think is really important for us as well. Mm. There's a bit more recent comments are about, you know, the cardio rehab. So we've got positive uh, impact, but quite a few people not offered it or offered it awfully late. So it just shows progress made by your group and researchers, but um, very much a work in progress to get equality of opportunity and access across the country. 
Yeah, definitely. It really highlights the differences. Um, you know, hard to get rehab is a regional thing, you know, as, as a national program. Um, you know, that doesn't really exist as such. This, it, it's more of a regional thing and it varies so much, um, you know, and, and it just highlights really how important it is for BeatScad to keep working in this area, um, you know, and, and try to get a more standardised approach towards um, SCAD patients. So I'll hand back to Colette now. Hello, uh, that's never happened to me before. <laughs> I'm really sorry. How did how how far did I get before I was talking just to me? Previous slide, I think. I finished that, had I? Just you would, yeah. You're part way through that one. Oh, okay. Oh well. So basically, the point of of this slide is that. Um, uh, you know, research tells us certain things, doesn't it? But actually, we are all individuals. So although it's important to acknowledge that if we are experiencing um, anxiety or depression or post-traumatic stress, um, if we are experiencing those things and we feel like we need to do something about it that's more than within our, you know, our own capacity and our own um family support systems then it's okay to reach out and ask for help because it's understandable following a SCAD but what I'm also saying is we don't all need to experience um, that in the long term um, some of us will be able to move on with our lives so um, Karen asked me to just look into fibromuscular dysplasia and what I was what I was saying to myself, I think, was that for me, uh, my diagnosis of FMD um, is kind of like um, uh, something that's happening over there, even though I do experience now, I know uh, some of the symptoms around um, uh, whooshing and tinnitus and um, headaches and stuff like that. Um, but for, for me, um, I guess I've I don't know it's it's just it's just there as something additional and it'd be really interesting to know, think about what other people think but this is a small piece of research that I found that also kind of indicates some similar worries um, and psychological issues for survivors of fibro uh, patients of, of fibromuscular dysplasia as they do survivors of SCAD so for example kind of the fear of death um, particularly I think more with the fibromuscular dysplasia if you're uh, you know affected in your carotid arteries which I am there's this thing about having a stroke and, and having a disability and I think that kind of like um, is chimed in this um, in this research and also thinking about um, other people which I think is also around how we feel as SCAD survivors and in terms of some of the symptoms, um, psychologically, here we've got depression and anxiety again, but also memory. And now I know that I'm going to use that as an excuse in my work, because sometimes I can't remember people's names. So now I know that it's actually a symptom. I'm going to be kinder to myself, I think. Um, and also in relation to um, FMD, we've got kind of some of the uh, stuff to do with loss and change and identity that are very similar to 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 SCAD. So I guess, you know, how we came to find that we had FMD is interesting um, and how that adds to our levels of psychological distress will be interesting for each one of us um, and how we move on uh, again. So the symptoms and the affected arteries um, will have an impact on how we respond. Okay, how am I doing for time? Because now I went back to Wolverhampton and back. Am I okay still? Yeah, keep going. Keep going. Okay, so this is really interesting for us um, as psychologists. And um, amazingly, you know, back in March, this person, Stephen Taylor, this book was out in terms of the psychology of pandemics. And it's really interesting because what he did was he kind of like predicted that before... Um, so, you know, it, back it before, he, he was in the process of predicting that there might be a, another pandemic, and then there was. Um, and so some of the things that I think are really important for us as SCAD survivors around the response to pandemics, 
um, are these because they, what they could do for us is they could make it you know a bit more intense not necessarily but a bit more intense so for example for the majority of people um, a pandemic um, their response will be that you know it's just how it is uh, they'll be okay um, they they might get a bit fearful um, they might be a bit fatalistic but generally um, people uh, may re may be quite resilient to it i'm not sure how we're doing now a year on but you know that that's what he was saying then um, and basically he was saying in his book that the psychological footprint of the next pandemic will which we're in now will outweigh the medical um, footprint and that certainly uh, is beginning to show itself particularly um, where the pan because what we know about covid is it's it's not behaving in an equal way um, people whose lives um, involved uh, you know, in relation to inequalities of life um, are experiencing different responses in, in their areas. Um, and so what this, this book um, tells us, and, and certainly we might well have seen um, some of these things going on, um, is that, that people might be responding with higher levels of anxiety. So for example, checking things, watching the news, um, trying to find for reassurance and cleaning a lot of cleaning and decontamination might be going on so some some of us might be doing that um, and that again from this perspective is kind of like what you would expect in response to a pandemic so that's you know that's that's okay this is the bit that's interesting for us I think as SCAD survivors is that you know if we are feeling a bit unsteady and a bit in relation to our mental health and we've got some men, uh, you know presenting issues in relation to anxiety and depression then they may get worse um, in this situation because we're out of control we haven't got any control on what's going on for us and so it will make them a little bit more challenging for us and more demanding and we're certainly seeing that in our children um, particularly where I work where um, you know children were presenting with um, with some uh, levels of anxiety but they have significantly in increased um, and so we you know we've got children who are uh, uh, self-harming and um, etc obviously that's because of the kind of jobs that we do but um, it, it just shows that if there is some underlying issues you, you know you might feel, feel feel worse at this point in time um, people will be experiencing grief um, and certainly um, that's going on um, where I work um, and that will compound um, our feelings of, of depression. What also might be going on is that we might be looking for cures and remedies and certainly you know um, President Trump led the way in terms of some of the things that he said and there's also this kind of mass panic remember the toilet roll buying stuff that went on to start off with so when I was I was watching that on the news and reading this book and I was thinking oh that's normal then and now and, and, and the other things that are going on in in, in different countries around um, civil unrest and rioting so I suppose what what this helps me to think about is um, as SCAD survivors and wherever you are on your journey um, all patients with uh, fibromuscular dysplasia we've got this kind of like level of, of, of emotion and this may well have made it worse for us um, and that's all right but we might now need to reach out um, you know for, for help more now than we did before and that's okay Okay, this is a really nice slide um, around thinking about um, where we are and where we gauge ourselves at different points. And I'm not going to hold on it because I think, you know, we need to, to, to move on. But um, it's a really interesting slide because it, it, it helps us think, wh where am I? So, for example, um, you know, if I am feeling um, kind of like aches and pains or exhausted, it's just a, a, a prompt to say, well, you know, how am I coping? Am I keeping up with all the stresses of what's going on? Um, or um, am I OK? Am I able to focus? And so I'm thriving. So that's a really nice, uh, a nice chart in that sense. 
Now, this is really important to, to us, um, and particularly, I think, to me, because it chimed with me in relation to my, my own journey. And what's really important here, and there was a question in about what's the difference between resilience and post-traumatic growth. So this idea of post-traumatic growth comes out of the um, phenomenon called post-traumatic stress. So post-traumatic stress is, uh, as, as I said earlier, is a, a relating to an event and it would be where you, the symptoms would be thinking about um, the event and running the video over and over. It would be thinking about uh, people being able to numb their emotions, block their emotions, which in the early, early stages might be useful, but in the long term is not. And post-traumatic stress might show itself by our hypervigilance and our hyper arousal around um, what's going on, what people are saying to us, how people are responding to us, and just checking that checking, so that we're, we're kind of on edge. Now, interestingly, for um, some of us, uh, this idea of post-traumatic growth um, is hopeful and interesting. It doesn't mean that everybody who experiences post-traumatic stress will go on to experience post-traumatic growth, but by labeling it, I think it's, a, it's useful for us. So the difference between post-traumatic stress and resilience in my head um, is that resilience is about experiencing trauma and bouncing back. Whereas for me, post-traumatic growth is experiencing trauma and growing out of that trauma so things become different things change so they're positive changes because of the trauma um, and these things might be changes in relationships you know people are people in relationships um, and they just carry it on and then a trauma happens and they give themselves the opportunity to reflect and they make changes changes in direction you know in terms of uh, life directions, work directions, um, new possibilities. They thought they'd never be able to do these things, but they, they are, and they're making them happen. Um, so post-traumatic growth looks like um, a change of direction, a change, a positive impact of something that's, that's negative. And so um, for me, it's about my work. Um, and I remember how awful I felt with my post-traumatic stress. And I actually um, am passionate about um, mental health for all children and young people. And I thought, um, you know, if I do live, I'm going to put my energies into that. And that's what I've tried to do um, as I've moved on. So you, we haven't got time, but you, you, you might think, oh, actually, that chimes with me. Um, in terms of these changes because some of these changes might have actually been quite distressing actually but actually they might be because of growing out of the of the trauma and then finally here we are you can read that for yourself although I can't help myself so it's important to be kind to yourself um, it's important to enjoy and notice the little things in life I think it's important to reach out and ask for help. I also think it's really important to try something new and different. Um, I think it's important to stay in the moment. For me, rumination was a big problem. Um, and the way that I managed to break out of that was by uh, being forced to leave the house, go on walks, and notice the things that are important to me which is um, the trees the greenery and actually notice the detail of what's going on it's really important to connect and even if you don't want to try and connect with others acceptance is really powerful and depending on where you are um, in your journey um, it will be more possible than others but trying to say it has happened is really important and the most important thing of all is don't beat yourself up about it because actually I think our researchers are getting even closer to the idea that it's not something we can control. There we go. Thanks Colette. Should I come out of there now? 
Um, I think Karen's going to curate a few questions. Yes, I am. Colette, that was wonderful. Thank you. Uh, I think it's very, very interesting. So I have a couple of questions here. Mm -hmm. um, the first one is, how does the percentage of SCAD patients who experience anxiety and depression before SCAD compared to the level of anxiety and depression in the general population? Yeah, thanks, Karen. Um, well, the, que the answer to the question is it depends how you measure anxiety and depression, because how you measure it will um, indicate how many people say what levels of, that, of depression or anxiety they've got or not. So if we look at um, the 2014 study by Liang um, and colleagues, they talked about 38% of anxiety and depression in SCAD survivors. And if we Google mind, um, and they would um, indicate 6% of the population, but the measure is the same, the general anxiety and depression um, schedule. So that does kind of suggest um, that we are, as a population, if we take that as kind of useful information, we are um, we are people who may you know who who experience anxiety and depression before our our scads compared to people who've not had scads. Thank you. There's been a request. Could you go back to your slide with each scad and all the descriptors? So your previous slide. Could you leave that up? That's it. Thank you. Okay, so um, another question that's been asked is what is the difference between resilience and post-traumatic growth? Okay, well I, I hope I tried there in terms of my understanding or well, my, my thinking around it is resilience is um, about bouncing back from, um, you know, back to normal uh, from, a, from a, a traumatic experience, whereas post-traumatic growth is um, change in a positive way because of and they could be quite big things you know and um, we've been doing this uh, this training with teachers in my local authority and people have talked about um you know resigning uh, going and living by the sea uh changing their work patterns leaving their partners mid mid covid so they're quite big things um but they are positive things in the eyes of the person doing them I don't know, are you there, Sue? Have you got any thoughts about that one? I am here. I think you have it. I mean, resilience is um, your capacity to adapt, I, I think, not, not just the bouncing back from adverse experience. Growth is a positive development. You have um, mm -hmm. capabilities, um, attitudes, lifestyle um, choices, um, which move you forward. I think we often hear about it when people have had the near death experiences that they reevaluate um, what their life, what is the meaning of, of life and what's important to them and rechart goals, um, harness capabilities that perhaps were just taken for granted. So I, I think, I, again, um, I'm very absorbed by the, the chat, but so, I mean, there are clear in very great differences as well as themes from um, survivors this, this morning. So, I mean, there will be differences, but I think the post-traumatic growth is um, sort of discovering in your self capabilities that you perhaps um, hadn't acknowledged and harnessing these to live. Um, a more fulfilling life without being naive, wet and soppy and sort of acting as if um, the risks that go with the SCAD and the FMD don't exist anymore, but it's, it's that re-evaluated um, way forward, which is um, more positive. I'm repeating myself. I'll switch the mic off again. <laughs> oh, thank you, Sue. Oh, thank you, Sue. So that leads to a question that's in the chat, which is, is it better to face something that causes anxiety or should we just avoid it? Is that the solution, avoid it? Mm, I would say no. Um, I, think, I think there's, um, you know, there's, there's levels of distraction that are useful sometimes, you know, when you, you, 
you need to do that but i think avoiding those feelings of anxiety will potentially you know could could potentially grow i mean there was one question wasn't there about how can i stop being over vigilant every twinge and panic i have and it's a similar thing really um you know for me to the question that you're saying there karen you, you can't completely ignore it because it, it's the, the twinges are important um and that because they're giving us information and you can't really completely ignore the anxiety because i don't think that's a healthy response in the long term um in terms of the the, the twinge and the panic um we have to work out how to live with them because they are real aren't they um and now we know that they are they are actually a, a, a clinical symptom when i had my first one my, i remember my gp i was saying to her about them and she said to me you know you can have psychosomatic symptoms after an event like this and i went okay so for ages and ages i thought that was in my mind i thought i was making up that pain and twinges and that didn't help with my anxiety at all um, but then gradually i came to understand via your work that actually it's real um, so i think there's a, there are similarities there between anxiety and um you know responding to our symptoms i guess mm -hmm. so i think it's like no as well, isn't it? there's a, a longitudinal process of adjustment where in the early stages there is perhaps a, a need to minimize and avoid um yeah. but that becomes a symptom of post-traumatic stress disorder if if there's um you know a, a kind of blinkered denial so that if you like psychological effort is invested in suppressing um anxiety evoking thoughts and again there's um one of the comments in the chat about the um the, the sort of myth that this is necessarily a one-off event somebody describes having you know had a, a scad and being told medically that uh, this is a one in a million um chance so the utter devastation caused when a, a second scad occurred many years later so i think there does need to be um cautiously managed um I mean, anxiety is a, an adaptive human response, isn't it? It's what makes us appraise risk and take effective avoidant or coping action. So if, we, if we're not um, tuned to threat in a proportional way, we're not equipped to survive in risky environments. Mm, thank you, so yes. I think that's really helpful. Does that kind of answer that question? I think so. I think so. And I think there's an opportunity for everybody to carry on putting questions in the chat. And also we can continue this conversation afterwards. So this isn't the end of it. Um, but I think I'll just ask one more question and then we'll move on. And then there'll be a chance right at the end. So if you sort of are absorbing all this, there's still a chance right at the very end for a little bit of a Q&A, or as I say, we'll carry the conversation on afterwards. So the final question is <clears throat> from somebody that was saying how difficult it is for them to emotionally heal when their family are so anxious <clears throat> and that they feel that spending, they're spending their energy on supporting them rather than concentrating on their own recovery. And they're asking how how can they change that? This is a difficult one, isn't it? No, it is a difficult. Perhaps it's one to think about and answer at another time. Yeah, I mean, I think that the thing that we we talk about a lot is around the circles around people. You know, the support mechanisms around people, um, and I mean. It, there's, it's quite com well the way that I'm making sense of what you said there is quite complicated. So first of all, how how do we connect with those circles around us, and who who are those circles in terms of support? But then, how do we make sense of what um, some people might call vicarious trauma, the trauma experienced by 
the family group because of our event and quite often you know they're they're experiencing a lot of stress and distress but they're trying very hard to 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 cope and um it's it's kind of how do we how do we enhance those circles around ourselves to be able to take that load off ourselves in terms of supporting others we've got to give ourselves permissions as well haven't we and each person needs to heal including our families in the way that they do that um so it's not our responsibility i suppose to to um make them heal or make them change but um that might be you know those permissions might be helpful in themselves okay i think that's something that um we as a, a charity have, have thought a bit about how we support the families and yeah. uh, we have our facebook group for family and friends uh, but there's probably probably more as a charity that we could be doing to support those who can then support the the person who's had the scan so that's food for thought for us as a, a charity yeah yeah i think we'll call it a whole uh, there now claire okay. um, yep. And then, as I say, there's still an opportunity to put questions into the chat, everybody. And so we'll move on to my presentation now about cardiac rehab. And I'll just work out how to share my screen. So um, anyone that hasn't already seen the rehab survey, BeatScad launched it um, as a, a rolling survey, really, um, to keep capturing new data as, as SCAD patients join the community and, and complete their cardiac rehab. So we did share some um, insight into it when we um, did the virtual conference towards the end of last year. Um, and now Karen's going to share more information about what BeatScad has learned about how attending cardiac rehab impacts SCAD patients. Thank you, Bex. So, um, um, what to say is that we uh, ran this survey last year and we had 242 responses so far. And the other thing to say about this um, uh, survey is that it is a rolling survey because um, as new people join the group and, and uh, do their cardiac rehab, we would really like them to contribute to the cardiac rehab survey. So the first thing to say is a big thank you to everybody that completed it so far. Uh, it's been really, really useful. There, there are, um, I think it's 40 odd questions, so it's no mean feat to plough your way through it all. And um, we, we really, we really have appreciated the detail that people have gone into in the free text parts, explaining their situation, explaining what happened to them in their cardiac rehab experience, because all of this is really helpful for, to us when we're looking at how we can educate cardiac rehab people to deliver a better service. Um, it's given us lots of ideas so far and it will continue to do that hopefully as more people complete the survey. So the first thing to say is that attending cardiac rehabilitation contributes both to physical and mental recovery for many of the SCADs who completed our survey. Uh, this is a really, really good thing because cardiac rehab people sort of think of it as only being the physical thing about starting to exercise again after your event but it is also about the mental recovery and as Bex said earlier it varies enormously across the country as to what sort of cardiac rehab you get and and how much it it means to you but um, generally speaking it's a really good way to help you with your recovery uh, one of the downsides of cardiac rehab, I think, for a lot of people was the, them feeling isolated because you're in a group of people who are usually a lot older than you, a lot more unfit, and you feel like you're sticking out like a sore thumb. And I think, as uh, Sarah and a couple of others mentioned in the chat, you know, the, the, the people there think you're the new rehab professional come to... to to take a session rather than an actual participant which is 
it, you could take that two ways, can't you? It's, um, it's difficult. I remember my own experience with um, some very end elderly gentlemen and uh, 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 it was just such an odd experience for the first couple of weeks, wondering why on earth I was there and how on earth was, was going to help me. But eventually I got my head around the fact that this was a safe place to actually push myself and actually do something physical that I'd been scared to do before and that I knew there were nurses there that could pick me up if anything happened. And uh, so I sort of thought about it that way and really sort of forgot a bit about everybody else that was there. It was all about me and what I could get out of the experience. So 42% uh, uh, said that it helped them feel mentally and more, uh, feel mentally more confident and physically stronger. And so that's a good percentage, but not good enough and not high enough. And that's something that we really want to think about in the future. The other sad thing I think about this survey was that 14% that weren't offered cardiac rehab at all after their SCAD. And with some of them, they mentioned it in our Facebook group and we were able to direct them uh, to evidence and, and to ways of actually asking for the cardiac rehab and they were successful, but, but others just weren't aware of it, didn't know anything about it, um, hadn't asked in the group or hadn't joined the group at that time. So it was something that they completely missed that experience. And that is a real shame. And some of the comments that we heard were about people saying their GP or their cardiologist said, it's just not for you, it's not, you don't need it. You just had a SCAD, you can just get on with life. You know those sort of comments which are just so unhelpful and uh, that's something else that um, education hopefully is going to change. So in our survey 33% uh, of those who attended cardiac rehab were offered a specific talking therapy as well as their cardiac rehab. Now that's not something that I experienced but I know Sarah and a lot of others did and again they found it really helpful to have that opportunity and um, I think that's a really good sign again as Beck said it's just so different across the country we're finding that that you know, no two places are the same in, in what they offer or how they go about it the really good thing I think is that 76 percent of the people said that they continued their exercise after their cardiac rehab course which is a really, really good thing. And, you know, exercise means different things to different people. So, okay, there's a, somebody on a bike there, but exercise can mean just walking every day. It can mean doing your Pilates or your Zoom. It doesn't have to be anything as energetic as that person looks like. Uh, but it is really important for all of us and for our well-being. And as people were saying in the chat, lots of people have been doing things uh, that they, they say make them feel good and, and there's a lot of evidence about how exercise is really good for you and in fact just this morning I was reading um, something uh, about uh, there's a recent study that has just said that regular exercise can improve people's uh, brain function by 15% so that's no mean feat either is it so that's something we'll share on the group and I think that that gives us all uh, uh, inspiration to do a little bit more exercise. So 67% said they would recommend cardiac rehab to a new SCAD patient. So again, I think that's really a positive thing. What it's saying is that for a lot of people, although they might have felt that you know, some bits of it weren't as good as they would have liked and they did feel a bit out of it with some of the other people that were participating, but generally speaking, there was some good to get out of the programme. And that's something that I personally endorse. I really feel it can be beneficial. I think the other thing that we talk about is that, that, um, that knowledge is power. And so it's a, a, an opportunity to talk to the people about your SCAD and explain it to them so that they learn what SCAD is and they also learn uh, how to help SCADs in cardiac rehab uh, in a more productive way, in a more supportive way. 
and we do actually get cardiac rehab teams con contacting us now when they get a scab patient. Uh, so that's a really good thing too. So finally, that to say that we know that obviously COVID has had an impact on the availability of cardiac rehab, and I noticed somebody in the chat was saying just that. Um, and we're planning to investigate that further. And so it's really, really important that anybody in the group that had their, had their SCAD sort of at the end of 2019, early 2020, all the way through and continuing, uh, to get their feedback about what actually happened to them. I, I, I've heard that quite a few people have just not been offered anything at all. Uh, some people have been offered an online version very few have had anything face to face. So that's something we really want to get to the bottom of so that we can understand what's happening in terms of that sort of support for people. So BeatScad still has some way to go in terms of educating cardiac rehab professionals. And it's, it's an important part of our educational strategy moving forward where really keep we we run training courses for cardiac rehab teams we've done quite a lot in the past we've got a couple coming up this year virtual ones which is interesting i did a virtual one with kings before christmas um so uh, it's really good that they're willing to learn and they want to learn and they want to be able to sort support scad patients uh in the future so that's really good and finally just to say to you if you would like to help us with the, the ongoing cardiac rehab survey by completing it, if you haven't done already, but also by help, helping us with sorting through the stats, coming out with the information from the survey that's going to help us. Or if, you, if you'd be interested in helping us with actually educating cardiac rehab professionals, then we would really love to hear from you and please email us on contact us at beatscad.org.uk. So that's just a brief summary of the cardiac rehab. There is a, a fuller detailed, there's a, lots of questions, so that there is a fuller detailed account of the survey so far. Um, but uh, I think that's all that we can cope with today. Uh, so with that, um, I will stop sharing my shit screen and then we'll see if anybody has any questions. Oh, no, we're not. We're not going to do that. I'm going to hand back to Bex. Well, do you want to do a couple of questions now? Um, I know there's been some comments just in terms of, I suppose, as a general comment that many SCAD patients are already very active before their event. Um, so, you know, like you're saying, you know, when you go to the cardiac rehab session, it feels very irrelevant to you because often people there are being encouraged to start some exercise, whereas, you know, SCAD patients may have come into it having been running 5k, 10k, you know, cycling, etc. So I suppose from that side of things, the cardiac rehab is more about confident, getting your confidence back. Um, and I think if you've taken it, you know if you've been put onto medications such as a beta blocker you know understanding the impact of that because i i know when i went to cardiac rehab um and they were sort of explaining to me how the medications because they were reducing my blood pressure and my heart rate you know it was sort of masking the natural elevation that happens with exercise so you know it was kind of learning what to look out for um so i don't know if you've got anything more to add to that Yes, you're absolutely right, Bex. I think that is the case. Um, my own experience, I, I was lucky, I think, in that my experience was a very positive one, even though it was um, 10 years ago, in that they recognised that I had a, a much better base rate of physical fitness than any of the patients they'd ever had before. They recognised that and they adjusted my programme accordingly. And again, as you say, Bex, um, being on that medication, um, probably your cardiologist or your GP hasn't really explained to you the full extent of what that medication is doing to you and how that affects you when you're uh, starting to exercise again. So I think exercising in that safe space is a really good idea. And it's also really helpful if, if, um, if they've taken into consideration what your base uh, 
fitness level was before your SCAD and they, they have a different starting point from the rest of the community. That does happen in quite a few places. I know um, uh, there's several cardiac rehab people I've spoken to and they definitely take that on board. It's something that the actual general program is supposed to assess a patient before they start their cardiac rehab and then adjust accordingly uh, as an individual basis. Uh, what we do know sadly is it doesn't always happen, but it's certainly something that we uh, in our role as educators can do to, to help people, uh, not only help people that are going to cardiac rehab by saying to them, these are the sort of questions you can ask and these are the sort of things you should be saying to your cardiac rehab team, but also on the other side with us doing the training. But it's certainly true that a lot of the people that did the survey mentioned this fact. So it is something that is impacting on people's ability to get a lot out of cardiac rehab physically as well as mentally. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, well, we'll do some more questions at the end. We'll um, give everybody a chance to put them in the chat and then we can collate them at the end. Um, so we're going to move on to Sarah's presentation now. Um, so another important part of a SCAD diagnosis, you know, is the fact that it's, it's scary and it can be very isolating. And, you know, to be able to talk to someone who, you know, has experienced something similar, you know, walked in your shoes, someone who gets it, you know, it, it's a really important part of, of recovery. And, you know, I know that from my own experience. Um, my SCAD was back in 2012. I'm just coming up to nine years. And it's about six weeks after my SCAD, I met a lady who'd had her SCAD back in 1999. Um, and so, you know, just to meet her, spend the afternoon with her, talk to her about her experience and everything, it really, really set me in, in good stead for recovery because I could see how well she was doing and I benefited from, from her experience and you know the support that she gave to me. So you know that's why you know a big part of the Beat SCAD mission is to support SCAD patients. Um, and you know part of that was to launch um, a buddy service. Um, and Sarah has been, you know, real driving force behind um, getting that going and also Colette and Sue have, have played a, a big role in, in helping us to get that programme up and running as well. So um, I'm going to hand over to Sarah to, um, to present more to you about wellbeing support after SCAD. Thanks, Bex. So yes, we've heard a lot of the sort of ideas, the research and the theory, and now this final section this morning is going to sort of um, show you some of the ways that SCAD can help you on a, on a practical level. So. Um, some of you will have seen this before, but you know this is our vision. It's a, a world that understands SCAD, uh, where those affected are quickly and accurately diagnosed and never feel alone. So the never feel alone is the bit we're going to talk about now. So um, similar to, to Bex, actually, I, I had my SCAD in, in 2014. And when I finally, after a week of tests and mystery in hospital, got told I'd had a SCAD, um, I was told that I was just very luck unlucky. Um, a second SCAD would be like getting struck by lightning twice and that I would never meet another person like myself. So I should just go home, get on with my life and forget about it. Well, both of those statements turned out to be very, very wrong. But um, once I got home, I, I couldn't resist it. I had to find out more. So I um, went home, did a lot of internet searching, and eventually I, I found out about Dr. Adlam. It took me about a month. Um, when I got in touch with him, he then uh, sort of got back in touch with me, replied to my email personally and said, would you like to be put in touch with other patients who, who've had a SCAD? And yes, I, I'd be delighted to do that. And it made such a difference, emailing and then talking with somebody who had actually experienced what I had experienced. The, the relief was just immense. Um, so these days things are different. Um, Debbie and I often admit new patients to the um, SCAD support group on Facebook while they're still in hospital having literally perhaps just that day received a diagnosis. Um, so for some of them, their hospitals know what's happened, they've got a diagnosis, they're getting uh, best practice treatment. Um, others 
we help them to advocate for the care that they actually need at this time. So um, we also know that we still have people join our, our online group who have found us after quite a substantial period of time, perhaps after a delayed diagnosis or a diagnosis that's been missed or misdiagnosed initially. So you know, we're not complacent at all, but what we want you to know is that you know, once you find us, you are no longer alone. So um, just a little bit of information about the support group. Um, you know, we're nearly six years old now, um, and we've got nearly 900 members. And you know, fundamentally, the people on that page just get it. There is an enormous variety of personal experience on the page. And there's also an awful lot of knowledge because we've got people on the page who come from backgrounds that uh, you know, healthcare or education or um, human resources, finance. So there's a lot of people there with a lot of expertise and they're generally very happy to share it as well. So what we like to think is that you know, as people figure out their own recovery path and their own recovery journey, they've got a group that they can lean on. Um, a group that will sort of um, cheer them on when they're having successes, a group that will pick them up on the down days, and um, you know, that will just be there to, to bear witness to the journey that they're taking. And um, something I always like to sort of say is that, you know, it is very much a case of the, um, the oxygen mask principle. You know, if you're in a plane and the oxygen mask comes down, you must put your own on first before you can help your, your children or your other family members. But you know, once people feel that they've come to terms with their own scab diagnosis, it's a really powerful thing to consider paying forward the support that you've had um, and helping others um, feel better about their own situations. If, if that's something that you'd like to do, it's always very gratefully received, I, I can you know, uh, confirm that. So, um, just before we move on to a few more details, there are a couple of things that I just wanted to highlight because I'm aware that a lot of people receive their information from the page um, as part of their own news feed. So uh, if you actually once in a while navigate to the page itself, um, you can then access our announcements and also the search function. And those are two really good places to use on a regular basis. Um, announcements is where um, Debbie and I always put the most important um, items. It could be information about COVID and, and um, updates from Dr. Adlam. It might be about events or regional meetups. It might be about latest research news. But uh, it's always good to keep an, a, an eye on that button. And then the search function is really useful because there, there's so much that happens in the feed that it very quickly disappears out of view. But um, if you use that search tool and then type in uh, keywords, it will pull up past topics on any topic. And um, a lot of topics do happen, you know, to, to, they do repeat themselves. So we have a lot of questions about insurance and life insurance. We have a lot of questions about returning to work. Um, for the ladies in the group, we have questions about um, uh, hormones and HRT. And then, of course, there's hundreds and hundreds of questions about chest pain after scab as well. So it can um, sort of give you a sense of, of other people's experience if you search on these topics and look at some of the previous posts that have been, uh, been put up about them. And not forgetting that obviously we also have a separate group, which is for friends and, and family. Um, so the two groups are distinct. Um, the one for SCAD survivors is purely for SCAD survivors, so that um, it's a safe place where we can share our own thoughts and, and uh, questions, concerns, uh, without worrying our family members. Um, and then uh, the friends and family group is, is the other side of that equation. It's a safe place for our family and friends to chat and support each other as they come to terms what's happened to their loved ones and as they try to support us. So um, if you've got family members or friends who don't know about this group, uh, please do you know, share this information with them. So um, for those of you who read my posts on the page, you'll know that I'm very fond of this uh, knowledge equals power. Um, I, I do think that um, it's so important for us all to do the best we can to get 
as well informed as possible with the condition that affects us. Um, it's, there, there are many ways that we can do this, joining the group, reading the research, um, signing up to get newsletters from Beat SCAD. Uh, the more empowered we are, then the more we are able to ask for what we need and what we want as we recover. So um, resources uh, that, that BeatScan provides, um, a really good start point is the uh, relatively new Living with SCAD tab. And uh, in that, it's a subsection which starts 10 things to know about SCAD. And it's always the start point that I recommend to any new member to, to our community. So um, we'll come on to that in a moment. But in addition to these things, uh, there are um, two other things that I would always recommend, and, and that is keeping some kind of journal or some kind of notes. And it doesn't have to be a formal diary. Um, I used to just type things into a Word document on my PC. Um, but what happens is, is when you do keep notes about how you're feeling mentally and physically, it helps you to spot patterns, it helps you to identify triggers, um, triggers for ill health or triggers for chest pain. And then when you come to speak to a, a doctor or a cardiologist, it helps you to look back and see you know, what you've experienced when, if there may be any reason to what you're experiencing. Um, so, you know, it's, it can't be sort of recommended highly enough to, to have some kind of record. I mean, long term, it allowed me to see that I was actually making progress. Um, you know, at the beginning, my first year, it felt like an absolute roller coaster. It felt like I took one step forward and two steps back. But by keeping a journal, I was actually able to convince myself that I was moving in the right, right direction, however slowly. So um, the, the second bit of advice I always give is to prepare for any appointments that you have. So do your research, uh, do your reading, um, and then write a list of questions. Um, try and think ahead about what you think the ideal outcome might be for the appointment that you're going to. Um, have all of this written down in front of you, either in, in your face-to-face -face meeting or more commonly these days on the telephone or in, in a Zoom. And make sure that when you're in your appointment, you go through all the items that are on your list. Um, and then, you know, hopefully you will end up getting as much out of that appointment as you possibly can. And also it will give you the confidence, if you're well prepared, to make sure that, you know, your doctor offers you what you actually need and what is aligned with what our SCAN specialists believe to be best practice. So um, I've moved slightly ahead of myself here, but um, basically I, I always recommend that it's fundamentally important that we stand our ground when we're talking with um, a, a doctor. Clearly we must stay respectful, but we shouldn't assume that our doctors know more than we do. Um, SCAD is no longer considered a rare condition, but it is not well known. And there is every chance that your, your cardiologist may be finding out about SCAD along with you. So um, if you find that you're not happy with the care that you're getting, then uh, we, we definitely recommend that you seek a referral and um, you can do that. There's information on, on the BeatScad website showing you exactly how to do that. Uh, and you seek a referral to uh, a SCAD specialist, Dr. Adam or Dr. Adia Hussein. So, um, obviously, we've learned today that uh, psychological impact of, of SCAD can be very, very large. And um, as Colette said earlier, there is no uh, right way to recover from a SCAD. Uh, everybody's SCAD is different. The way that we, we recover from our SCAD is different. And everybody has to choose their own path to recovery. What we can say is that generally, for most people, things get much better with time and with healing. And um, something that I've found, um, and I think it links in with uh, Colette's words about post-traumatic growth, is that sharing my story when I was strong enough to do so, felt powerful and it, it led to change. And um, 
one very recent example for those of you who are familiar with what's happening on the page at the moment i recently asked for people's stories of uh, presumption and bias that they'd been uh, the receiving end of when they um, had paramedics or ambulance people come to their houses um, during their initial events and i had 48 very heartfelt replies and basically what those replies um, showed was that there's a lot of bias, there's a lot of presumption that gets made, people get told they're having a panic attack when actually they're in the middle of a heart attack. Um, they feel sometimes dismissed by the, the people looking after them. And the positive outcome of, of telling your stories to um, contacts that I've got in the world of paramedics means that um, paramedics and critical care, care paramedics who are responsible for providing uh, care to a population of over 14 million people um, across part of the UK. Um, the way that they are recruited, the way that they are trained, and the way that they are assessed before they are, um, uh, they are allowed to graduate is going to change as a result of sharing our stories. Now, that is an incredibly powerful thing, and um, I'm so proud of everybody who took the time to share their stories with me. And for some of them, it was at, at some personal cost because they had to relive um, some difficult times. So um, I think, you know, we know that mental recovery is, is important and there are different ways that we can uh, seek that help as we go through that recovery. But um, sharing our story when we feel strong enough is, is, is very, very important. So just a few little pointers for those of you that haven't found it yet. Um, this is our home page and there's a new tab called Living with Scan. And on the right of this slide, you can see all the subsections um, that uh, we now have lots of content under them. So, um, you know, if you haven't had a look around, please do. Um, those of you that follow on the page will, will know that I often point people to specific pages as a way of, of trying to increase everybody's knowledge and understanding about their, their scan. Um, and within the subsection emotional support and exercise, you will find our buddy service. So the buddy service, um, this is very exciting development for us. Um, you know, we know that having a SCAD can cause a massive shock to our sense of self, our sense of being. And because you know, most of us have few or no cardiac risk factors, it is um, a huge shock to our entire psyche. Um, so, it's really important that as a community we, we support each other. Um, so the, the Facebook online community is a lifeline for many, many of us, but some people feel that in addition to that, they, they would like a little more support. So um, late last year we introduced the buddy service, and um, you know, this is sort of an extra service that is on top of all the things that we've, we've always done. So we've always organised conferences and walks. They've been in the real world up till the last 12 months, but now they're happening online. Um, so you know, this introduction of the buddy service is a, a sort of result of a long term goal to provide a more personal approach, um, a, a personal support system um, and, uh, you know, it started, uh, we went live at the end of last year, and uh, I'm now going to tell you a, a little bit more about it for those of you that haven't come across it yet. So um, our buddies are people who are just like us, just like you, just like I, um, and they've gone through a SCAD and they've recovered it from it well themselves. So we as buddies are not trained medical experts or counsellors. Um, the first buddies um, are the five trustees, and also uh, six additional SCAD survivors, some of whom are on the call today. And we will be um, seeking uh, further people to um, be identified and, and train up as bodies. So um, we are not medical experts, we are not counsellors, but we say that we are experts by experience. Uh, we're well informed, we're empathetic, and we can identify with, with what it is that we're going through. And um, we do have a huge debt of thanks to Colette and Sue who are on the call today, but also their, their colleague Neil. Um, and um, I, I like to think of them, they, they, they were the midwives who helped birth this service. Um, they spent many, many hours talking with us about 
what we could do, how we could do it, and the right ways to do it so that it was uh, meaningful and safe. So the way that the service works is that you um, complete a request form online by following the link to um, the buddy service that I showed on the previous slide. Um, we then get in touch by email to discuss the support that you might need and then we match you with a buddy and then your buddy gets in touch. So um, the way that you interact with your buddy will vary. Um, some people um, will um, you know, be happy writing by email, others would like to talk um, or one day you can have to meet face to face. Um, I should say that you know, at this point all the buddies like our BeatScad trustees were volunteers working in our spare time. We don't know how much demand there's going to be for the service. Um, so far we're coping with the demand that's coming through for a buddy very well. But um, if for any reason we have uh, a lot of requests, we may have to get in touch with you and, and say that we'll be uh, able to match you with a buddy as, as soon as possible. But um, you know, for anybody who feels that this would be a help, then um, I would like um, to just um, say, you know, please click on the link and um, you know, we'll do our best to, to match up with someone very soon. So um, just a very quick look at the small print, which you'll find on the website, um, which goes into some details about what we have to do and the duty of care that we have to keep everybody safe. Um, and just to emphasize that while we are a confidential service, we can't offer an anonymous service. Um, buddies who use the buddy service must use their real names. Um, and uh, while what we discuss with your buddy remains confidential, um, BeatScad buddies providing the service are supported by other buddies um, and the trustees of the charity as we support you. Um, so you know, we always adhere to uh, BeatScad's privacy and data protection policies. But uh, we have to look after everybody, both the receivers and the givers of, of this service. Um, it's important that boundaries are set, um, and it's support, important that, uh, you know, that everybody uh, respects uh, everybody's personal boundaries. Our job is to um, empathise with you, our job is to sign things to provide information so that you can have the best possible recovery from your SCAD. So, um, so yes. And, Moving on from that, a uh, little summary of what we've learned so far. So, um, as for people who've requested a buddy already, um, quite a few of them have found that one call has been enough initially. Um, they felt it's given them a, a good understanding, it's uh, given them some a good idea of support that's available for them, and it's made them feel secure. Uh, they've been signposted towards uh, information and knowledge, and they know that they can come back to their buddy and they can ask for more help uh, going forward. So uh, there are other buddies who have um, said that you know, they prefer having some regular ongoing contact. There are no hard and fast rules when it comes to how you organise your buddy relationship. It's up to you and your buddy to, to figure out how often you want to be in touch. So for those of you that have used the service already, um, you know, we'd love to hear from you and we will be in touch sort of you know, formally, semi-formally, asking for some feedback um, in the not too distant future. But um, you know, tell us what works for you. Um, we welcome ideas from anyone um, as things they think that might be helpful. And, um, and just to repeat, to say, we'll let you know if there is um, a long list of people who are asking for the service and, and there may be a little delay, but so, so far we're keeping up with demand. So, um, final thing for me is that um, we'd love for you, if as when you feel strong enough, um, perhaps you've uh, benefited from post-traumatic growth in the way that Colin was describing earlier, that um, if, if you feel that you could be a buddy, or you'd like to be a buddy, um, make sure you're well yourself. But then if you enjoy listening to people, if you enjoy encouraging people, if you enjoy connecting with people, then please do get in touch with me and um, you know, we'll um, you know, be collating a list of people who are interested in doing this job and uh, in due course there'll be some, some more buddy training and, and we'll be expanding our, our numbers of buddies. 
So um, thank you very much for listening to that. And uh, I think now there will be time for some more questions if there are. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Um, I think, Karen, do you want to lead the Q&A again? Oh, yes, please. Good to see if we're all still hanging in there. <clears throat> so there was a couple of questions about rehab. Uh, so one was about sharing the rehab survey link, which I've done in the chat, but I think we will again on the Facebook group, uh, just so that people can see that. So if you haven't already completed it, it would be great if you did. Uh, what resources can we give to the cardiac rehab teams to help them understand SCAD? So we have downloadable leaflets on our website. Uh, under the useful documents section, plus uh, a link where you can order printed leaflets if you prefer uh, um, and you don't want to print them out or can't. The main ones for the rehab teams are SCAD for health professionals and aftercare for SCAD patients. The rehab teams can also email BeatSCAD at contact us at beatscad.org UK and we can give them more information and we can also offer them an educational session so that they can learn more about the SCAD, learn more about the patient experience and patient need. So we're very happy to do that. Um, so another question was, if I'm not offered cardiac rehab or I'm told as a SCAD patient I don't need it, what should I say? Well the first thing that we say to people is that you refer that team to the European positioning paper, which says that cardiac rehab is safe and beneficial for SCAD patients. So that, that's the holy grail, if you like, because that's there in, in research literature and that's what it says. So hopefully they will take notice of that. Uh, and the aftercare for SCAD patients leaflet also reinforces that. And um, just to say that if anybody had a real problem, that with getting any, any cardiac rehab, uh, they can contact us and we will help with that. Um, so somebody is saying, I started cardiac rehab, but stopped going. Before my SCAD, I was a fit, healthy runner and um, I felt out of place in the room. Well, you're not alone there. That we all probably have felt alone in, in the room with all those people that we just couldn't relate to at all. Um, and uh, this person's experience is that they kept talking about smoking and unhealthy he he eating, neither of which uh, apply to SCAD patients. Um, so, and what is the advice we would give to people in, in, this, uh, in this position? And I think, you know, as, as we've talked about before, knowledge is power. And I think the, the way to handle that is to actually have a word with your cardiac rehab team and ask to speak to them. Um, and if they haven't given you a proper assessment in the first place where you would have had the opportunity to talk about SCAD, talk about what your fitness level was like pre-SCAD and talk about what your, your hopes were for the cardiac rehab, then they certainly should do that after the first session if they're clearly not addressing your needs as well as everybody else's. I mean, it is fair to say to the cardiac team that they have a curriculum that they, they are, are having to cover because of the majority of the people in that group need to have that information. And I think in my case, I just sort of zoned out on those bits and then just perked up when they talked about the medications, which I was on everything you could think of at the time. Um, thankfully not anymore. And um, when they were talking about things, that, um, in my particular case, they talked about things like um, being in the moment and relaxation techniques and things like that. So I sort of tended to zoom in and out of what was appropriate for me. But certainly, I didn't have the confidence at the time to talk to my cardiac rehab team on the side and say, actually, this isn't doing anything for me. But I think now, with, with BeatScad support, you can do that and, and I think uh, it's an opportunity to actually help them learn more as well as you getting the best out of the cardiac rehab session that, uh, that you can. So I hope that answers that question. 
Um, let me just flick through. So, um, did I have any here? No, I haven't got any for. I haven't got any questions for Sarah about the buddy or the well-being pages at the moment, unless there's anything else on the chat at the moment. Now, I think that's probably it now. No, I can't see anything else in the chat. So unless anybody else has got a burning question that they want to ask now. I think Sarah's put um, a link to the, some of the leaflets in the chat, which is uh, useful for everybody. Anything else the other trustees or Colette and Sue would like to add to the? Well, I, I, was, I was just thinking back to um, what Colette was saying about her personal experience in terms of her, the difference um, in recovery from her first and second SCAD. Um, so obviously, I mean, you have psychology training, you know, that's, that's your career. And um, I suppose that was a, a benefit in a way, as well as what you learned after your, your first SCAD, um, you know, to obviously, to then have a, a quicker recovery, if you like, um, after your second SCAD. So I think uh, those words sort of really hit home with me, how important it is for, for Beat SCAD to make resources available to, to to you know boost the the recovery from psychology you know the psychological impact um because i think you know what you've said there versus the research that's obviously out there um i think that maybe your personal personal knowledge was a benefit there do you, do you think that that's the case between one and two yes yeah, so you said that you got back to work quicker in the yeah i think i think after the first scad i felt so bad um and so distressed and panicky and out of control um and it took me months to i don't know if the psychological bit was a barrier you know it took me months to get that realization I kept on fighting myself and fighting um what was going on in my mind and and, and getting nowhere and, and actually retreating more into the house and um you know in the end it, it was because of my partner actually literally forcing me out with the dog um that that started to move things uh, forward for me and also I did have um some counseling as well um so i don't know it, i don't know if that helped me but the difference between one and two was i spent ages um all the time thinking i was going to have a second scad um and all every twinge fired off a panic response um for ages and ages and ages um, and still does now actually um but it's just a bit different now and all, I suppose all I can say is, is that um, if you are having a second scad, you know you're having it. Um, and I've got a little mantra that we work through um, for ourselves um, and I still use it now. And, and I say to myself, what is the rule with this pain or this tweak or whatever? What is the rule? And the rule is, if it doesn't stop, do something about it but just wait a minute because it might stop and it stops every time apart from the time it didn't stop. <laughs> <laughs> if you know what I mean. So, yeah. I, and, and so the difference really is because I think I was stronger the second time. I was like, I was so determined that it was going to be okay. And I was going to be okay. I'd had all the information. Um, Dr. Abby um, uh, got, you know, was with me there with the second scab. Um, I knew it wasn't as bad as the first scab. I've got all the all the intelligence and knowledge from you um, and the support from you. And I was just determined. It was like stubbornness that this wasn't going to take me down again. Um, and I wanted, I was determined to get back to work and do that thing with the post-traumatic growth thing of the, you know, the whole school approach to mental health. And I was determined not to miss out. So there was something that was really kind of making me do that. Sarah, did you have a comment or a question? Sorry. Um, 
I was just going to say what I think we'll probably end up doing is um, a little summary note that we can send out to all the participants this morning with useful links. Um, and there's a question in the uh, chat at the moment about where the recording will be put. Um, I think we've got to figure out the logistics, but um, again, we'll let you know when it's available and it's most likely going to be on our YouTube channel. Uh, but what, I think what we probably will do is also, as a separate thing, have Colette's um, uh, presentation available on the, on the website in, under the wellbeing emotional support um, section as well. So we'll let you know what we do, but um, you will be able to access this again. Thank you. Anybody else? I think we need some wise words from Sue just before we close. <laughs> Put you on the spot. I'm going to say. <laughs> well, you're not going to get any. What I was going to say was I hope you're noticing the, the comments like Kim's a while back, you guys leading and running Beat Scad are simply fantastic. A lifeline for many of us and there are other comments about the empowerment that you and the Beats SCAD groups bring. I think um, as I've said before it's a, a real privilege to be associated with such a, a feisty and resourceful group of people. So that's all I'm going to say. Thank you Sue, yeah and well Beat SCAD is, is the SCAD community um, you know, we are the five faces that are sort of, you know, doing the paperwork, if you like. But the charity is is the whole community. And, and, you know, as Colette was saying about her own determination, it's that's what you see throughout the community. People are struck by this sudden event that turns their life upside down. And, you know, that determination comes through. It, it comes at different phases for, for each of us. You know, we've already talked about how recovery is not the same for each person. Um, and there's no right or wrong way to do it. You do it your way. Um, so, you know, thank you, um, Colette and Sue, for, for joining us today. Um, really enjoyed your presentation. We will make that available. Um, to share with people who are here today who want to see again and obviously people who couldn't join us today. So, um, you know, really, really insightful, lots of things to think about. And um, yeah, really appreciate you spending your, your Saturday morning with us to, to do that. Um, and, you know, thanks to Sarah and Karen, our own, <laughs> our own trustees, pitching in, you know, a lot of work goes into these events, getting the presentations ready and, you know, trying to um, make it as useful for you as we can and um, so yeah really heartfelt thanks to to all of you really appreciate it and um just to I've say <clears throat> sorry thanks. i've got a request actually powerpoint is a real challenge for me uh, <clears throat> i can't take credit for the one today somebody else did the photos for me um, but if anybody else is a whiz on powerpoint and they want to volunteer <laughs> that would be really, really useful to me, uh, or to all of us, I think, actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, Debbie does a lot of our background work as well, so I have to say a lot of thanks to Debbie also with uh, you know, event management and setting everything up. There really is so much that, that goes on um, to, to pull everything together. Um, so, you know, thank you to, to everybody and yeah, we're, we're always appreciative of any volunteers that have got skills to, to help us out, to make us, you know, do things more efficiently um, and more effectively. So, so yeah, we're always happy to hear from people. Um, and, you know, this was a free event. I will just put a little, a little beg out there for any donations. Um, we are a charity after all. So, um, you know, information about how to donate is, is on our website. Um, so we really do appreciate any any donation that, that's possible. So it just remains to say um, a final thank you to all of you. It's been really nice. Um, I've enjoyed the event. I think I needed it as much <laughs> as anyone else. I've been so busy myself at work. Um, I can't <laughs> can't accept any responsibility for this event. It's really been everybody else that that's brought brought it together. Um, so I've enjoyed it as a, as a participant. Um, so thank you to everybody for 
making it a great event um, and I hope everybody's found it as um, enlightening as, as I have and offers a bit of reassurance um, and, a, and a little bit more knowledge um, to, to fight SCAD and, and keep on progressing. So hope you all enjoy the rest of your weekend um, and yeah, bye for now. <laughs>